Guys, um, I want you to open your Bibles uh, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, or you can just follow on the screen. We have it up on the screen for you also. And we started the series six weeks ago, and um, the idea was for us to get back to basics as a church. And this church, the church at Thessalonica, the very first area that, and the very first epistle that Paul wrote to a church that he had only been in for three weeks. He's writing back and he's trying to encourage them and he's trying to also answer questions that they have. And we'll see more about that in the weeks to come, specifically what those questions were. But really up until now, he is just checking in on them. How are you guys doing? How's everything going? That's the kind of thing that we see here. And it's important for us to realize in the middle of all the chaos, in the middle of all the things that are going on right now in our world, and now close to a year that we've been dealing with COVID, things can get a little bit out of order. Thing, people have a lot of fear, there have been those who have gotten sick, those who have passed uh, because of this uh, pandemic. And so sometimes we tend to believe there's got to be something we've got to do. I believe what we've got to do is stay faithful to what God told us to do. Just the basics. Hang on. Endure. And God's going to bring us through this church will come out stronger. So Paul is dealing with a group of people who were under persecution, just like he was. And we've seen that over the weeks, haven't we? There are those who are enemies of the cross. There are those who are not interested in listening to the good news and even less interested in receiving it and believing it. But then there are those who are also threatened and they want to run us out or in the case of Paul, they kicked him out of Thessalonica and he went on to Athens, but then he sends Timothy back to check up on him. And then this letter is the report uh, of what and how they were doing. So chapter four, we're just going to look probably... Uh, this morning at the first 12 verses, because the last part of this is going to move into um, Paul explaining to them a little bit about the rapture and the second coming. So I'm going to reserve that for next week. In the meantime, let's just start right here at verse number one. And uh, what I want to do is pray before the sermon, that's okay with you guys. Uh, Father, bless our time in your word, and it is your word, and this is your truth, especially for those of us that are believers. Uh, help us to hear uh, attentively and allow the Holy Spirit to minister and to uh, work in our hearts, specifically as it applies to our personal lives, individually, because each and every one of us have needs, each and every one of us, Lord, have issues and problems that we're dealing with in our lives personally, in our homes, but also as a church, as a collective body of believers. Help us, Lord, together uh, to see what it is that you are asking of us, to understand what you're encouraging us to do and to continue to do. And we'll thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first verse, I'm just going to break it up, and you know me, I go through verse by verse and explain it. And I think there's some interesting things here. It says, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. There's a lot being said here. This section, it as you saw here, it says, uh, just as you um, were taught, right? Just as you received from us, as we taught you. I think what Paul is saying here, he's trying to teach 
and have the believers uh, remember how they're to walk. And all of this has to be seen in the light of the coming of the Lord. See, something happens when we're reminded that what we're doing now should reflect the fact that we understand he's coming soon. You see what I'm saying? It's kind of like saying, how you're walking now should be understood in the light of the fact that Jesus is returning. And that really should inspire us to be attentive and to have a little bit of urgency in what we're doing now. What we do now is motivated by what's coming. Isn't that the case in life? And so he says that. And he says, we are to walk in a way that will do what? That will please the Lord. You guys see that in the verse? We're to walk in a way that will please the Lord. How many of us want to please the Lord? Amen. That should be our desire. What he's really saying when he uses the word walk here, you can easily take, and I've seen other translations, he's referring to living in a way that pleases God. This is what he's talking about. How you live. What you allow and what you don't allow in your life. It should be motivated by the fact that you want to please the Lord, and by the fact that He's coming soon. In other words, how we live should be always important to us, because one day we'll have to give an account. He's coming. And we want to be found, what? Faithful and obedient. That's all he's saying here. I think it's important too. He says, and notice that he mentions there um, at the last part, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. What he's saying is, this is a church that is a model church. They're an example to us because he's saying, um, this is how you're already living. Right? Just as you are doing we should keep improving. We should keep growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. We should keep making progress. That's what he's saying. Keep moving forward. You're doing it already. This is not um, chastisement or correction. This is encouragement. Just as you, what? Just as you're doing. You're doing it. Keep doing it. That's all he's saying here. There's an interesting verse in 2 Peter 3.18. It's not going to be up here, but I'm going to read it to you. You can write down if you want to and look at it later. Peter says this to the those he writes to. So this is completely in agreement with Paul to the Thessalonians. Peter says the same thing to, to his congregation or to the people that he's writing to. He says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of his of, of eternity. So notice how eternity is on our minds. The second coming of Christ is on our minds. So keep growing. And how do we grow? It's impossible to grow without the grace of the Lord and without knowledge. We don't take and we cannot make one more step forward. We can't mature, we can't develop, we can't move forward and progress unless it's for God's grace. I want to encourage you. Yes, sometimes things are difficult. Yes, sometimes we may be discouraged. We may be challenged by our issues of our life, problems. But guess what we have to help us move on? God's unmerited favor. We have God's grace. And I look back at my life as a Christian and I realize there's no way I could be here today. There's no way I could 
move forward if it wasn't for God's grace. So what Paul is saying, hey, just keep doing it more and more. Notice the end of the verse. See, Christians cannot do, and what the goal is, is to please God, right? Christians cannot do as they please. We need to be doing what pleases Jesus, what pleases Christ. Now verse 2, he goes on to say, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Oh, how do they know this? Because he taught them when he was with them. Right? We've been saying that. He's been using this word, for you know, for you know, for you know. You know, we're only responsible to God for what we know, not what we don't know. So don't worry about what you don't know. Sometimes we focus so much on what we don't know, we never do what we do know. I don't even think I could say that again twice. <laughs> do you hear what I'm saying? When we stand before the Lord, when He comes, He's not going to ask us what we did with what we didn't have. Just like the parable of the talents. He only asked him, what did you do with the talents I gave you? Did you yield, a, 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 did you invest it, and did you produce uh, something with it? So, we can kind of relax. What is it that you know? What is it that you've been taught? You're only responsible to God for that. So, kind of shake off everything else. God's only concerned about what you do with what you have and what you know. For you know what instructions we gave you. Uh, happy is the pastor and blessed is the church where there's this transaction taking place. Where you're being taught God's word, where you're hearing it, and by hearing, your faith grows. That's what we're doing here. Anything else is going to come up empty. So I'm, I'm encouraged this morning because I'm up here uh, motivated by my love for the Lord and by my love for, your, for you guys. And here's what the Lord has to say. These are His instructions. I give it to you. Now what you do with it, that's between you and God. This is what He's saying. You know what instructions we gave you. Let's not be ignorant. Let's not have and heard, ignore what God's saying to us. That's a miserable way to live. Because you can never unknow what you know. It's like somebody, in the, uh, sometimes in the kitchen, you know, things fall to the floor when you're cutting stuff up and on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the counters. And, and the next thing you know, you look down there, you could just easily just take it and sweep it under the little carpet. And you say, it's all gone. No, it's not. You know it's under the carpet. We just, I mean, we can try and hide things, or we can try and ignore things, or hopefully we can never say we're rejecting what God says. That's not where we need to go. We know the instructions that were given to us, right? They, through the Lord, and here's the important thing, never should it be my instructions as the pastor. I'm simply sharing with you what I understand God is saying here, and you get to look at it just like I do. This is through the Lord. What Paul is saying here is, he's affirming the authority behind his statement here, that we should walk in a way that pleases the Lord. He's affirming that this is the authority I have. It's coming from where? Whose words are these? The Lord's, right there. So the teaching is divinely uttered, if you want to make this come into a different light. The, the Word of God is reinforced and emphasized. Scripture's inspired, Paul would say to Timothy, by the Holy Spirit. This is God's Word. These are God's instructions that we're reading. They're reliable and they're credible. Verse 15, and we're not going to go to it here. We're going to see that next week. But he repeats this in another way, where he says, For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord. So it's the second time he says it in the same chapter. These are the words of the Lord. We need to pay attention. We need to understand that if we receive the words of the Lord, what we're receiving are words of life. 
So, what's he specifically asking? He's asking us to walk and to live in a way that pleases the Lord. What is that? Well, we continue looking at verse 3. He'll tell us right at the beginning. The first thing he mentions, and let me put it into context. He says, for this is... Because the question is, okay, so how do I live in a way that pleases the Lord? So Paul addresses a problem that that particular church had in that particular place. But I don't think it's too far from America either. And what does he say? And if you were to ask me, okay, pastor, I want to live in a way that pleases the Lord. I want to walk in a way that pleases the Lord. Okay, and then Paul says, here's the way. This is God's will. Your sanctification. I'll stop at that one, at that point right now. Okay, sanctification. What is the will of the Lord? Sanctification is what it says, doesn't it? I remember as a young Christian, I, I saw this word and I didn't even know what it meant. It even sounds kind of like theological, doesn't it? I mean, you could almost hear some of the pastors in my past, uh, for this is the will of the Lord, your sanctification. And you're like, oh my God, what is that? I'll explain it to you. Sanctification is also translated in other Bible verse, uh, uh, Bibles, translations as holiness this is the will of God your holiness that you be holy now the word comes from Greek hagios so I went in to look at it what does it mean it talking about being separated it's referring to something that's uh, consecrated literally we have been set apart for God's exclusive use. Paul understood this because remember, he was on the way to Damascus to arrest Christians and have them in prison. And on that road to Damascus, a bright light sh shone upon him. He was had all the intentions to persecute Christians. And who appears? Jesus. Then he tells Paul, hey, well, Paul asks, who are you? I'm the Lord Jesus. And then Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Well, I'm not persecuting you. Yes, you are, because you're persecuting my church, the my bride. And, he, and then Paul, uh, Paul would hear Jesus said, it's, it's difficult to kick against the goads, isn't it? It's kind of hard to fight against me, isn't it? And so he said, I have called you. I have chosen you. You are going to be an apostle or someone that sent to the Gentiles or the good news of the gospel, I'm setting you apart. That's what it means. Sanctification is the same word as holiness, which simply means that we have been set aside for God's purposes. We have been set apart for God's exclusive use. And that should be something that you consider to be a privilege. We are now instruments in God's hands in order to reach the world with the good news of the gospel. I brought some stuff up here. I want to kind of give you an example. So I'm just looking around my house for stuff that I have that's common. Maybe you can't see them. In here are a bunch of clips. There's like a big, huge paper clip, right? There's some of these kind of paper clips right here. These are actually for like a bunch of papers, a big bunch right here. I don't know if you guys can see them. These, these little clips. Here's some that are even, here's another one right there. I'm going to put them right there. So, And then here's another one that's even smaller, baby clip. I use them a lot for paperwork to keep together. Right, there's another one. And then there's just a bunch of them in here. All right? They're all the same. They look alike. They do the same function. But guess what God does? God looks at all the world and He calls us. We respond by faith to the good news. And He then sets us apart from the others. It's the same one as these. But this one, very different from these, which I'm just going to put back in the bag. This one now is sanctified. This one now is holy 
or simply set apart. Why? Because it's mine. It's the same as these. No. It looks the same, it does the same thing, but it's in exclusively an instrument for God's use and purposes. It makes it totally different than these. Oh, let's use another example. I don't know if you guys got that one. Okay, I found a bunch of pens. There's probably 20 pens in here. And, you know, they're all different, but they do the same thing. They write in different ways. These are highlighters. There's a, there's a, a ink pen. There's a Sharpie. There's a red uh, color pencil. A highlighter that's pink. Another pen. These are all just pens and pencils and writing instruments. But... And you know, they're they're all they look just like everyone else's pens and pencils, and I'm sure there's thousands, if not millions, of these made. As if there's only one special thing going on here. Pastor Robert decides that this is gonna be my pen. This pen is considered holy. This pen is considered sanctified set apart for my exclusive use. This is a very special pen to me. When God called you and set you apart, you are very special to Him. You are unique. And He knows exactly how He wants to use you. Do you guys see the difference? This is what Paul is saying. The will of God is that you be sanctified or that you be set apart from the rest. This is a very amazing position. The doctrine of sanctification can be looked at in three ways. Positionally, you are in Christ. Once and forever, you belong to Him. He has purchased you with His precious blood. You are not your own any longer. That's His grace. The other one is that it's a process. Because we still live in this world, this world of sin, this world with all its temptations, this world with all of its influences. We still have to learn and we are still being sanctified. It's a process that will take all of our lives. So we're constantly growing and improving just like we mentioned in the first verse. We will fail, we will mess up, we will have our setbacks, but He doesn't let us go. He keeps sanctifying us. And then there's a complete sanctification, which means that one day we will be completely set apart in eternity. And the job will be done will forever be with the Lord. There's three parts of sanctification. The one that we're in now is, first, we're positionally in Christ. No one can snatch us out of His hand. Once we trusted Him, once we accepted the gospel, the good news, once we confessed our sins, once we turned from them. This is the process. This is the idea of sanctification. Right? Right? So, I'll give you another example. So, I'm done with these. I'm going to go ahead and keep my pen. I'm going to put these over here just a second. So, I'm not tempted to get other ones. I got the ones I want. They're mine. Well, that's what the Lord says about you. You're His. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I'm going to build on this some more, and that's why I'm not going to be able to go too far today, but I'm going to build on this. I want to talk to you a little bit about what that meant to, the, to, the, uh, to Israel. When God called Israel, or Abraham, He set him apart. He made promises to him. He told him, I'm going to make you a great nation, and a great people. And through you, I will bless all the nations of the earth. And those that bless you, I will bless, and those that curse you, I will curse. So God set him apart, and we know that the blessing to all the nations is his descendant, Jesus. So God had a special purpose for Abraham, and eventually what became Israel, 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Out of Israel, out of Jacob come 12 tribes. Those 12 tribes form the house of Israel, the nation. They're taken out of Egypt. And then God begins to teach them, you are sanctified. I've picked you. No one can thwart. That means no one can interfere with my plans for you. Not even the Pharaoh who wouldn't allow you to leave. I'm separating you from Egypt. Egypt has always been a type of the world. I'm taking you out of the world. Get the picture? They go into the desert and he begins to teach them things. He gives them new laws, the Ten Commandments, and much more. He teaches them and asks them to build a tabernacle, a tent, where he, God himself, would live in the middle of them. And then he says, I want you to, uh, in the tabernacle, I want you to build different vessels and instruments. For instance, cups, candle stands. A, a, a table for bread, an ark. I want you to build these things. They're going to be holy to, unto me. They're going to be set apart. It could be just like any candlestick they might have seen in Egypt. But this one now is in the temple. So, those utensils in the temple that would be used for sacrifices and for worship, right? They were what? They were set apart and and a side, uh, a set aside for God's use. Now, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, that we ourselves are earthen vessels containing the treasure of Jesus in ourselves. Because where does the Holy Spirit reside? Who is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You are. The, the Holy Spirit resides in you. You become a vessel, or in this case, a temple. And Paul tells us to keep our vessels, what? And our bodies pure. Now I want to talk about a king. The son of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He followed uh, after his father passed. Now remember, Israel, and, or specifically Judah and Benjamin, were taken into exile because of this, their disobedience. Because of their disobedience, because they failed to observe the law, they failed to observe the Sabbath, they failed to honor God, God allowed them to be taken into Babylon for 70 years. And the temple was destroyed. See, because God can do whatever He wants with our lives, even discipline us. He can discipline us. Now, when they got there, and because they destroyed the temple, they took all of these vessels, all of these things that were sacred and consecrated to the Lord, and they carried them off to Babylon. Well, in the year 539 BC, Belshazzar, which was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, he decided to have a party. And in spite of the fact that his enemies, the Medes and the Persians, were beginning to surround the city, he felt overly confident that there was no way they were going to be able to break through the walls. And basically, uh, this party continued, and they got drunk, and then he makes a fatal mistake. He says to his servants, go get the golden cups and the utensils that were carried out of Jerusalem, and let's use them to party in. Now remember, I told you those cups and those utensils, they belong to who? To God. Don't touch what belongs to God. There's another lesson. And they're pure. And so he didn't humble his heart. So what happens is he's partying, he's using these things that belong to the temple. And all of a sudden his finger comes on a wall and writes something. And he's all scared and shaking in his boots. I don't know if he wore boots. Maybe he's shaking in his sandals. But here's the point. None of his magi or his magicians or his, quote, prophets could interpret the meaning. So 
Someone says, hey, Daniel knows how to interpret dreams. And Daniel says this to him. Hey, Belshazzar, you haven't humbled your heart. Although you knew all this, referring to the temple vessels, you've lifted yourself up in pride against the Lord, and the vessels of his temple have been brought in before you and before your lords and your wives and your concubines and you're drunk from the wine that you poured into them. You have praised the God of silver and gold and you've praised the gods of bronze and iron and wood and stone, which you do not, which you can't even hear and neither know because they're nothing but inanimate objects, right? But the God in whose hand is your breath and in whose ways are all in yours, in other words, and all your ways are in his hands, you haven't honored him. Let me tell you the rest of the story. So in the midst of this revelry, a hand appears on the wall, and what was written was many, many tekel ufarsin, which meant, when it was interpreted, you have been weighed in the balance and you have been found wanting. Tonight your kingdom will crash down upon you, and surely enough, the Medes and the Persians, they couldn't get through the wall, they couldn't get over it, they couldn't get through it, so what they did is they dammed up the Euphrates rivers, and guess how they got in? Under it. And he was partying, thinking that he was safe and secure, he was dishonoring God because he took those sacred vessels and was living a La vida loca, as they say in Spanish, not considering God or honoring God, and guess what happens? The kingdom collapsed that night. So it is, it is a big deal what you do with what God has set apart. Okay, I think I got the point across. Paul says then in this verse, to the Thessalonians, I want you to know that you are holy because God has set you apart and you are being made more holy day by day keep growing keep progressing right be clean be pure be honest that's a big deal for the church we're to be Pure and clean and honest before the world. No more lying and cheating, manipulating. No more living in a way that doesn't please God. So Paul says this to them, that they should maintain this idea that they're set apart, be consistent in their testimony, in the middle of a pagan culture and world. You see the difference? We're in the middle of a world that doesn't know God. We have something to say before the world by being pure and clean and honest. Boy, does the world need that today from the church. There's so much that has happened this last year. You may not believe it, it may be true, it may not be true, but fraud is fraud. Rioting and beating people and killing people is a sin before the eyes of the Lord. Cheating and lying are sins and fabricating and making things up that are true are sins before the Lord. Mistreating people is a sin before the Lord. I don't care what side you're on. I'm not here to talk about blue or red because they both are guilty. I'm talking about us as Christians. that We need to be holy. And what he's saying is, I don't want you to fall into the immorality of the world that's surrounding you. So I'll say it this way. Faith is the root and Sanctification is the fruit. When you have faith, it's like roots that grow deep into the ground. And the fruit that it produces 
is that you are holy before the Lord. You are set apart. You are different. And so, without sanctification, without being set apart or without being holy, if we're not living clean, honest, pure lives, then our faith is a sham. It's not true that we know Him. It's not true that He lives in us. You guys see what I'm saying? The reason is because the life of faith implies the residence of the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit resides in your heart, then the fruit of the Spirit will be seen. Starting with love. Amen? Now, I said all that <laughs> to get to this question. Does your life, does your life match your profession? Are you who you say you are? It's important to make that evaluation. Understanding we're not perfect. That's why we've got to, or have to grow by grace, day by day. But the one sin that Paul was addressing to this church, and I think could easily be applied to our church and to America, is what? Sexual immorality to start off with. I don't need to go too deep into that, but what that means. He says that you abstain from sexual immorality. This is called fornication. I'm not making it up. That each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. That in the passion of lust like the Gentiles, or rather not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. We're to keep our bodies pure. Referring to specifically sexual sin. That's what he's talking about. Why is that a big deal? Because I mentioned to, to you earlier that our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are reserved for God's glory. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Right? That no one, verse 6, transgress or wrong his brother in this matter. Apparently... There may have been people who were cheating on others' wives, or vice versa. No one transgressed. There's a line, guys. Transgress means to tra transgress means to trespass. Means to go beyond the line. We have limits. He's saying, don't go there. Because it's not going to be helpful for you. It's going to be damaging to your witness. Right? Somebody wronged his brother in this matter. Hey, God is the avenger. That sounds kind of scary. What does that mean? That God is going to ask you to give an account. He's the one who will avenge all these things, as we told you before and solemnly warned you. So simply, we're to be uh, honest, and we're to be pure, and we're to be kind, and we're to be loving in our relationships. Don't go beyond that. That's what he's saying. In every way, don't transgress, don't wrong don't take advantage of your brothers, even if you could. You see, we live in a world that, and we live in a time where if someone can do something against you, they will. It's your fault because you didn't protect yourself. No, that's not how it works in God's kingdom. You don't go there because it's not your place as a Christian. So, we're not to be dishonest. The Lord's the avenger. He will ultimately work out the justice when we've been wrong. Verse 7, For God has not called us to impurity, but to holiness. Correct? Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives His Holy Spirit to you. Basically what Paul is saying, if you refuse this word, you're not refusing us, the apostles, the pastors and teachers, if you refuse what we're saying to you today, you're rejecting God. 
stay in your lane, is what he's saying. Stay in your lane. You ever hear that? <laughs> There's a guy who got in my lane the other day. I can't say I handled it as good as I should have. It scared me. So he pulls up next to me, and he rolls his window down, and he goes, What are you doing? I go, oh, That's the question I have for you. You were in the outside lane. I pulled into the inside. The next thing I know, you're on my on the, my rear end. He goes, I put my I put my blinker. And I go, No, you didn't. And I was kind of like forceful with him, you know, like. And I realized after he drove off because he was going the other way, how easy it is for us to what? Get out of our lane. Just watch ourselves. Now concerning, this is almost, we're almost done. Concerning brotherly love, he's saying, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Hey, this is the basics of our Christianity. To love each other as God has loved us. To forgive each other as God has forgiven us. He goes on to say, and to aspire to live quietly. Verse 11. Wait, I'm sorry, verse 10. I forgot to read it. Uh, verse 10. Uh, for, for that indeed is what you are doing. Remember you told him earlier, you're doing it. You're living this way. Keep it up. Okay, and you're doing it throughout all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Notice, keep growing. Keep moving forward. Keep maturing and growing in your faith. Keep making progress. Look at the, at the prize and keep your eyes on the prize. And then he goes on to say, and to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you. I think this is interesting. Um, <laughs> this, this part about to live quietly, I thought about it quite often. It's referring to one, a person who does not, who, 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 uh, who, who presents social problems. There's that person who always generates conflict among people. <sighs> to live quietly. Do you ever run into people that are just nothing but a bunch of loudmouths? <laughs> and all they ever do is get in your face and point their finger at you and challenge you, right? They're, they're, in First First Timothy two two, he says we should live a peaceful and quiet life. So it's not the first time Paul said it. He said it again: a peaceful and quiet life. Quiet refers to the absence of being a disturbance. Someone who again who's always loud. They always have to make their opinion known. They know it all. They're just basically disturbers of the peace. Don't be that person. Be quiet. <laughs> I was going to say, um, I don't want to be rude, but, and Paul was so gentle in how he said it, no? But sometimes to those people, you just want to tell them to shut up. <laughs> You say, oh my gosh, Pastor. I'm just being real. He's saying for us as Christians, don't be that person. Why are we quiet? Because Jesus was quiet when he was being scourged, when his beard was being plucked, when they thrust that crown on his forehead, when they mocked him on the way to the cross, and while he was on the cross, oh, you said you were the Savior. Why don't you... Come down off of that cross, and, it's, and they insulted him, and it says in the scriptures, he didn't say a word. He kept quiet. Why? Because he knew that his Father in heaven would eventually make all things right. That's where we are. Aspire to live quietly, and, and mind your own affairs. <laughs> I love this because what he's saying is don't be a busybody. Right? 
In Spanish we say, no seas chismoso. <laughs> Don't be a busybody. Don't you have enough to deal with it's on your own plate? In your own home? Why are you getting it into everybody else's Kool-Aid? That's what the kids say at the high school. I get it. We have enough to worry about and enough to be responsible about in our own lives. Take care of your own affairs and mind your own business. You know, sometimes it's okay to say to someone, I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I think you should just mind your own business. See, there's nothing wrong with being direct when it's right. I'm not saying to be rude and nasty and you know, offensive. I'm just saying, hey, I'm standing my ground. That has nothing to do with you. Move along. Right. Work with your hands. Apparently people were not working. You know why? They misinterpreted and took it to the extreme that since Jesus is coming, we're just going to sit around and wait. And they were becoming a burden to other people. That's what happened. Hey, you better work with your own hands as we instructed you. Right? Let's go to the next verse. So that you may walk properly before outsiders. Hey, people are watching you. That you may walk properly and be dependent on no one. You know what? If we work, we don't need anyone else. We can be uh, autonomous. Self-sufficient in the grace of God. Be depend don't be a burden to someone else. Because you're not working. Because you're, you think Jesus... That's, that's the context, but it applies a lot today too. Get out there and take care of your family. Get out there and work you'll be feeling much better. Work for what you need. There's a new feeling in government today to where they're supposed to take care of us. No, they're not. Not the Christian, at least. Be careful of the one who takes care of you will later demand more of you. As if though you're obligated to them and your alliance is with them. No, you're obligated to yourself and your family. Work so and walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So, Paul finishes, and this is where we're going to stop. Paul reaches a point where I think he's given us an idea of how we should live. We should live trusting God. We should live and understand that he has separated us from the way the world lives. Whatever that means. We don't look for the world's approval. We want to please God. We are quiet because we know that the Lord will have the answers. And we are not in everybody's business because each one of us is responsible for our own. And that's enough. And we shouldn't be dependent on anyone else. We only need to depend on God. That's how we should live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you because uh, some of these things uh, put everything kind of like in, in place. And, and we can rest in the fact that this is what you've instructed us. And Lord, we want to continue to please you, so help us to be consistent and to understand who we are. We belong to you, and we should live in a way that's different than the world, who doesn't know you or have the hope that you bring in, into our lives. They don't know who to turn to or how to handle the issues of life, but we have you as our provider, and we rest in that, and we're thankful for that. Bless us, Lord, we pray, as we strive to do the things that make uh, you 
uh, happy and that please you as far as we're concerned. We ask these things and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.